Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this week we are going to focus on linear regression analysis, uh, and we kind of got started on that last time by talking about covariance and correlation. So I want to just kind of keep going in that general direction. Uh, and my goal for this sort of unit in the class is to make a series of relatively short conceptual videos and then pair them up with um, short uh, videos on how to run R commands that will help us actually do the analysis that we're talking about in these lectures. So um, this one is relatively brief or should be relatively brief, but it's going to involve a lot of math. Uh, and I will say a bit more about that as I go through it. But um, I think the main benefit of that for you guys is that in the past, I used to draw uh, a lot of equations on the board. And if you look behind me, you can see kind of what my handwriting looks like. Uh, and there's a lot of time spent drawing equations on the board or writing equations on the board and then people trying to decipher them. And lo and behold, you're not going to have to do any of that uh, deciphering this year uh, or if you're watching this video at all. So you can kind of be thankful for that. Uh, I'm going to kind of just focus on the basic concepts uh, behind the math uh, rather than figuring out how to understand what I've written down. Uh, so just uh, rely on the PowerPoint, I guess I would say, for that reason. And like I said, I'll say a bit more about uh, the importance of the math or the relative unimportance of the math as we go through it. Um, and I've got uh, this link here at the beginning of this lecture because I think it's always kind of fun to do something a little bit fun at the beginning of a lecture to kind of get into it. Uh, but I'm actually not going to do the fun part now. <laughs> I put it here at the beginning of the slides, but there's a better spot to give it a go halfway through uh, the lecture. And if you've watched the um, video on covariance and correlation R commands, you've seen this game already. So it's not maybe a surprise for you. But in case you didn't, I wanted to make sure it got out there um, for you know everybody to enjoy, <laughs> however so briefly. Uh, but we'll do it a bit later. Um, and instead, I want to start out by reviewing what we learned last time with, again, the goal being uh, to develop a basic understanding of how the analytical method of linear regression works. Um, so as that name implies, uh, the method explores the possibility of a linear relationship between two gradient variables. Uh, that's kind of just the foundation or the sort of circumstances under which we would actually use this approach to try to understand what's going on in our data. Um, yeah, uh, I'll say more about this too as we go as we figure out how the math works. but. Um, to a certain extent, this is going to rely on figuring out uh, the means of these two different gradient variables. And kind of in older-fashioned statistics, people did a lot of calculation of means and like how far away different data points were from means, that sort of thing. Uh, and to a certain extent, they've moved away from doing that in modern or contemporary uh, statistics, um, especially for linguistic analysis. Um, but one thing that hasn't people haven't really moved away from is the linear concept that there's a linear relationship between two different variables that's still commonly used uh, throughout stats. So to a certain extent, I want to teach you this stuff so that you can you will be able to use it yourself is number one, probably the primary goal. But number two, you should be able to understand it when you see other people using this method, uh, even if where you see it is typically in like older literature, um, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, it's still a valid method to use uh, under certain circumstances. So let's just figure out what those are. Um, so here's the review part. We talked about this last time. The equation for a line is y equals mx plus b. Uh, and this is kind of a funky little notation because m stands for slope and b stands for the intercept. Yeah, the shorthand isn't really useful there, but be that as it may, that's what people used to write out an equation for a line. And last time I talked about this equation expressing a relationship where x is the independent variable, or you could think of it as the independent variable, and then y is the dependent variable. Uh, so x, again, is not independent of us. That's the thing that we can kind of tweak um, to set however we want to in our experiment. Uh, but then what we want to find out is this whether there's a relationship between x and y. So when I say that y is dependent, I just mean that it can depend on x. Um, and then we can tweak x to see if we get changes in y that go along with it. Uh, another way to think about this relationship, though, is that we can use uh, potentially use x to predict the values of y. So in a lot of cases, when we have a strictly linear relationship, like um, in the example I gave you earlier in the semester about the transformation between Celsius and Fahrenheit, 
there's an absolute relationship between these two. So if we know the value of the temperature in Celsius, we know exactly what it's going to be in Fahrenheit and vice versa too, right? Uh, there's no leeway there whatsoever or no ambiguity. But in a lot of cases we'll be, where we'll be collecting data with um, two different variables, uh, it won't be an absolutely determinative relationship. So an example I gave you last time is like there's probably a relationship between a speaker's height and their F0, uh, but it's not absolute, right? So normally if you're taller, you have longer and thicker vocal folds and you'll tend to have a lower F0, but that's not always the case. Um, so that's kind of the situation we're thinking about here. And then, you know, if you say you look at a person and say, oh, you're so that, um, you have that height, you know, you're five foot six. So for that reason, I would guess your F0 might be in this range. Um, you can make that sort of prediction, but you wouldn't expect to be absolutely right every single time, right? Um, yeah, and here are these little notes about slope and intercept, but basically, again, we're talking about cases where um, there's this sort of relationship, or it looks like there's this sort of relationship, but it's a bit fuzzy. And if you want to go back to uh, the examples I used in the signal detection theory um, experiments where we had signals being transmitted through noise, you can kind of think of it that way if you want to, where maybe there's like a, a clear linear relationship, like there's a line out there, and then there's a bit of noise, uh, a bit of randomness in the data, uh, kind of obscuring that relationship a little bit. Um, okay, we also talked about covariance or, and correlation, or I guess I should say that I talked about it. Uh, hopefully you listened too. But in that discussion, <laughs> or monologue, we introduced a new metric, covariance, that represents how closely related two variables are to each other. So covariance, <clears throat> the equation for it looks like this, which actually looks very similar to our, relation, our equation for variance, um, except that for variance we have this um, the sum of squared deviations. So the uh, x sub i, the individual x data points, um, minus the mean of uh, x or whatever the variable happens to be, we'd square those deviations and then uh, sum those square deviations and divide them by the degrees of freedom. In this case, we're not squaring the deviations for one individual variable. We're multiplying the deviations for one variable by the deviations for another. Um, and then we can get this interesting information of sort of direction, right? So if the, you know, the deviation for x is positive and the deviation for y is negative, then they're poorly correlated or they covary in opposite directions, I guess you could say. Um, that'll have implications later as we go. For now, I'll just say this is the equation for samples because we have n minus 1 is the degrees of freedom on the bottom. For populations, divide by n. Um, it works a little bit differently for populations because you assume that, you know, you've gotten the data for every single, you know, relevant uh, item in that sample in the entire world. Say if we were to, you know, measure the height of every single living person in the world at this moment in time, and then also measure their F0 in some utterance or something like that, uh, you don't kind of have to estimate any of these parameters like, the mean F0 or the mean height or what have you, you know it uh, because you've got the entire population. Uh, but normally in this case, we that would never actually happen, right? You don't go around to all 8 billion people on earth and measure their heights because uh, you have better things to do. Even though it might be fun to find all that information out, we'll leave it until we have an infinite amount of time on our hands. Um, anyways, uh, and let me know if that ever happens to you. But anyways, uh, we also introduced a normalized measure of covariance called R or the correlation coefficient. So I said that covariance is interesting. It's a little bit different from variance because it gives you kind of like directional information, like are X and Y kind of deviating in the same direction or not. Um, but it doesn't have limits. Uh, so it can go from negative infinity on one side to infinity on the uh, high side. Uh, we can kind of curtail that by uh, creating this measure of uh, correlation uh, called R, where we divide the covariance by basically the standard deviation of X times the standard deviation of Y. Uh, and this is a really cool uh, quantity. It can do a wild variety of different things. Uh, for now, let's just focus on the basics of this guy. So when the deviations of x and i, x and y from their respective means match perfectly, we get an r value of 1. So that's the upper limit for r. Uh, and the lower limit for r is negative 1. And that's what happens when the deviations of x and y from their respective means are always the exact opposite of each other. So anytime I get, you know, a deviation of negative 4 for x, I get 4 for y, or vice versa, so on and so forth, I'm going to wind up with an r value of negative 1. Uh, and then there's also the case where r is 0, 
And that means that there is no relationship between X and Y, or there's no predictive relationship between X and Y. So knowing something about X basically tells you nothing about Y in that case. Uh, whereas in these other limits, like R equals one or R equals negative one, we have a perfectly linear relationship. So if I know the value of X, I know exactly what the value of Y is going to be in either one of these cases. Um, so uh, that's what we see when we have the traditional sort of linear equations we've been playing around with, like the relationship between Celsius and Fahrenheit. But in most cases, we're going to be somewhere in between R equaling zero and R equaling one and negative one. And I think that's the first time in my life, even as a teacher of mathematically oriented stuff, where I've used the verb equaling. Uh, but who knows, I might use it again. Anyways, the nice thing about R in this case is that it has limits and a clear interpretation. And that's the context in which I wanted to show you this kind of silly but fun game called Guess the Correlation. Uh, and like I said last time, um, I typically play this in class uh, along with the rest of you. I show you how to do it first, and then the class gives it a try. So it, what we're seeing here is here's x. We're plotting x from 0 to 1, or plotting y from 0 to 1. <coughs> and they're always going to have um, some sort of positive linear relationship here. So uh, kind of have lower numbers on this side and higher numbers on this side. But it's a question of how related the two are. Um, and so if it was a perfectly straight line, then it would be 1. The R value would be 1. And if there was no relationship, we just got a jumble of dots through here, then we'd have a value of 0. We're somewhere in between that now because you can kind of see like this moving in this direction like a line, except there's a lot of scatter on either side of the line. Like I said, you kind of think of this as like maybe there's a signal, uh, sort of an absolute or idealized version of this relationship in the middle here, and then there's noise pushing the dots on either side of that. Uh, this one's a little tricky. It's not as clear of a relationship as I'd like to start off with, but I'll guess it's about 0.6, and the value is 0.63. Uh, and this is like, it's, you know, created like a, um, you know, early 1980s video game, I guess, in terms of the graphics and whatnot. And these three hearts mean that you have three lives. So if you guess further away from the true R, true R uh, further away than 0.1 from the true R, then uh, you lose a life. <laughs> so uh, let's see, this one is not as clear. Let's go 0.4. See, yeah, I lost a life. There goes my heart. Uh, and it was 0.1 away. It wasn't that bad. So anyways, let's keep guessing. I should probably not talk as much so I can focus on this very important game. Oh, it's 0.48. The ones in the middle are harder. Um, this one's a clearer relationship. We'll say 0.85. Yeah, I'm doing better. So then I get a life back if I get close enough. See, I told you this is exciting. Oh, man, it's 0.78. Um, this has got to be up there, too. Yep, got to get within 0.1. I'll keep going until I die, hopefully. I will die soon. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> I didn't mean that literally, by the way. Generally speaking, I like life because teaching is so much fun. Anyways, this is a poor relationship. So this is um, R is going to have a pretty low value. I'd say just put 0.1 here. Yeah, but... <laughs> That's the funny thing about these relationships. It's hard to kind of see them when they're not that strong. Um, I do poorly on this game when R is in a value between like 0.3 and 0.5. It's just like, Ugh, I don't see anything there. So I usually guess low uh, or something like that, like I did right here. Um, but that's the nice thing about this method is that it can quantify that relationship, even if it's hard for us to see as human beings. Um, so how do we do that? All right. If we have two variables, x and y, can we predict the value of one from the other? Uh, maybe. So it depends on how well the two variables are correlated with one another. It depends on that r value, and we kind of need to know that to figure out how the whole thing works. So um, what follows here is going to be a lot of math. Um, and we're going to start off with a new expression for uh, our equation for a line in a slightly different form. Uh, y equals bx plus a. Uh, and in this case, it looks exactly the same as what we had before. We just have different labels for the slope and intercept. So b is going to be the slope here, and a is going to be the intercept. Just, it's a different way of expressing it, I'm sorry. Uh, but it'll make it kind of easier to do the housekeeping as we go. Um, I'm also going to say the particular details of, like, this derivation I'm going to give you uh, are not super important. The important parts of it I will try to highlight as we go, but I just want kind of want to walk you through the algebra so we can see how we can get from one sort of expression of um, these 
concepts that we have, like R or the equation for a line, and how they wind up being the same as what looks like a totally different form of the expression in the end. Uh, I when first teaching this class with the textbook we have, I found that R kind of gets expressed in a lot of different ways, and it wasn't clearly um, or wasn't made clear like how they relate to one another. So part of what I want to do is kind of make that relationship clear. Um, if you're curious, I kind of. This is, I guess, one point where uh, when we start doing math as opposed to statistics, with math, you know, things fall into place. It's a clear, you know, puzzle where we can kind of solve it and get a nice um, sort of absolute perfect solution to it, which I think to most linguists' minds is a little more satisfying than saying, oh, there's, you know, there's a signal in there, but it's a bit fuzzy, so, you know, it's not a perfect relationship, but we'll just kind of accept that as it is. Uh, that kind of goes against our natures, or at least it goes against my nature a little bit. So indulge me a little bit, even if you don't like math here. It's just algebra for a few slides, and then we'll move on. Um, but that's where all this inspiration is coming from. And if you don't like math either, that's fine too. I'll make it clear to you what you need to know um, by the end of this lecture and when we start doing the next homework. Um, first of all, I'll reiterate this point that I kind of made before. By using a, an equation like this, where we have two gradient variables that are not like absolutely related to one another in a linear fashion, we're assuming there's some sort of linear connection between the two, uh, even though there might not be. But that's sort of the framework. That's our model that we're sort of applying to this relationship. And we're gonna see how well it fits, basically. And by the end of this process, we'll come up with something called the best fit line, like the best sort of predictions we can make for the situation. Okay, so, um, in addition to assuming this linear relationship, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to predict the value of the deviation of y from its mean by using the deviation of x from its mean, which is kind of funny. Um, why don't we just start with x and y and not use the means here? Uh, but we're gonna, this is gonna help us out in cases where the relationship between x and y cannot be absolutely determined. So there's going to be a bit of messiness in each of the predictions we make, uh, and we're just going to have to kind of accept that, that we're not going to be perfect throughout. Um, yeah, I think, like I said, the, the kind of intuitive appeal to lingu of linguistics to most linguists is that you can kind of get like a perfect so uh, solution in the end, and you wind up with your, you know, uh, conjugation table or something like that, like dot, 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 everything falls into place. Uh, that isn't how it works in the world of stats. Um, things get messy and we just have to deal, what we're trying to do is figure out how to deal with the messiness in the least messy way possible. Um, yeah, so this is going to be, include all the cases we have to worry about here. Uh, this is not an interesting, we well, you know, when there is a perfectly linear relationship, the uh, the solution is pretty simple. Uh, we're dealing with more comp complex cases than that, where there's not a perfectly linear relationship between two variables, but there might be a bit of a linear relationship between the two. Um, and for that purpose, we're going to have to think in terms of like deviations from these predictions. So there's a lot of math up ahead. I'll quit giving you the preamble for it, and I'll just kind of explain to you how it works. I just want to make sure I got my timer here so I don't go over time. But uh, we're going to start off the process by defining uh, a new notation. Uh, it's y with a little, uh, again, what is this accent? Uh, I can't remember what the name of the accent is in French, but uh, circumflex. Uh, yeah, but that's not what we call it in stats or math. This is y hat. Uh, so it's a little upside down chevron here uh, pointing down into the y. So y's got a hat on it. And what that means is these are the predicted values of y. And in this case, we're going to be predicting these values of y from the values of x that we already have. Um, it's kind of like known data or, you know, our independent variable. Uh, so mathematically speaking, because we're using the deviations of x to try to predict the deviations of y from y's mean, uh, we're going to have an equation of this form. So y hat sub i an individual predicted data point for y minus the y mean will equal b, or the slope of our equation, times x sub i, or an individual data point for x, minus the x mean. Um, and these two, you know, are paired data points, right? So we have one, but you can think of it like, well, this is a speaker, his height is six feet one, or six foot one, I guess, and then he speaks with this f0. Uh, y sub i, but instead of talking about the observed value of f0 from this speaker, uh, I'm going to make a prediction that his f0 is going to be like 126 hertz or something like that, right? 
Um, okay, so that may or may not be the case. What we want to figure out is what value of b, what's the slope of this equation going to be that will give us the best predictions for y, or y hat, if you want to call it that. Um, so we're going to formalize this goal with this expression, or I'm calling it a desideratum. Uh, so this is, um, this part of the equation here is just y sub i minus y sub i, y, minus y hat sub i. Um, take that difference, square it for all the different items in your sample, for all the different i's, and then sum all those deviations to get an overall measure of how much um, deviation you're getting in your prediction. So to back up for a second, when I say y sub i, this means an observed value of y. And when I have y hat sub i, that means a predicted value of y. So let's say we'll go back to this example case where I have some speaker and I say I think his F0 in this case is going to be 126 hertz. Uh, and then I find out my observation is uh, it winds up being 130 hertz. Then I've got this deviation of 4 hertz, right? I'm just coming up with a random example, but that's what you get. This is observed. This is predicted. And then you wind up doing that for every single item in your sample or every single speaker in your, subs, you know, in your subject pool. Uh, you square those deviations, you sum them up, you get an overall measure of how much your prediction screwed up, basically how off were your predictions. What we want to do is minimize that total value. We want to make that as small as we possibly can. We want to get the best predictions possible. So we're going to minimize that. Um, and I've got this note here about if you stop and think about this equation for a second, it should make sense. Um, and I've already kind of walked you through this part, but this puts it in writing in case you have need to see it a second time. Uh, and what we're trying to do is minimize the distance uh, between the two. We're minimizing the error in our predictions of y. Um, and before we get into that, we're going to kind of expand this. We're going to use some algebraic trickery here uh, to kind of collect some terms and make it look like something we've seen before. So let's start off with this just general relationship where we're trying to minimize the distance between our observed and predicted values. Uh, in the parentheses here, I'm going to both add the mean of y and then subtract the mean of y, which I can do because these offset each other, so it's sort of like adding zero. Uh, so like I said, a bit of trickery is involved here, but once I do this, I can kind of collect terms uh, and come up with different sorts of parts of these that look familiar to what we've seen before. So if I take the y's of i and subtract this mean of y, I can collect those in these parentheses. And then on the other side, I've got positive average of mean of y minus the um, predicted values of y. Uh, if I kind of factor out um, a negative term from both of those, then I wind up with the predicted values of y minus the mean of y. So that's kind of nice because I've got the observed minus the mean and then the predicted minus the mean and I'm subtracting this difference from this difference um, in the end. Still the same exact equation, just in a different form. And also I can convert it even further because I said that this bit here, the predicted values of y minus the y mean is equal to uh, b, our slope, times the observed values of x minus the x mean. And if you don't remember where that's coming from, that's kind of what we started off with here. We're trying to come up with an equation of this form. Uh, so that's just kind of where we begin. Uh, right, so the predicted values of y are what we can get out of the x values, so we're just replacing those with the x values. Um, and now eventually what we're going to want to do is solve for b. Uh, but before we get there, we have to do something called taking the derivative of that equation. Um, and actually, even before we get to that, uh, what we wind up doing is we divide that equation by the number of samples n. Uh, this is thinking in the sort of idealized population terms because we're doing math here as opposed to stats, so we can think of the case where we know everything in the world uh, and then put it in variable form. Um, but basically, by dividing by the number of samples n, we're kind of just coming up with an average deviation between predicted and observed values for each observation. So it looks like this. And again, the reason we're making this move is because it's going to make things a little more convenient later on algebraically. So don't worry about it too much if you're like, what the heck is that about? But what we're trying to minimize now is this quantity. So this is what we had on the previous slide. We're dividing that by n, or the number of items in our sample. Uh, and then we're calling this whole equation the function f. 
And the reason we're calling it f, I alluded to a second ago, is because we're going to take the derivative of that function. Um, and this is a concept that you are probably familiar with if you've ever taken a calculus class. And if you haven't taken a calculus class, uh, this is the only time we're even going to touch upon that part of the field. Uh, and I'm going to say don't worry about it too much. You don't really need to know how this works. Just, but if you do know how it works, then you can kind of see where this is coming from. Uh, but basically what the derivative of function tells us is that it gives us another function that describes how f is changing at any particular value of x. So this just tells us what the value of f is for a particular value of x. Uh, if I take the derivative of it, it, so like, you know, if you have kind of like a parabola like this, this is my expert calculus class, uh, you know, the value is changing kind of rapidly on the sides here, but it's kind of bottoming out here in the middle. The derivative kind of tells you some information about how it's changing as x changes. Um, the value of f changes as x changes. So what we want to find out is um, the point of interest in our resulting function will be where it equals zero. Because like I said, we're trying to find uh, the minimum point uh, for that overall equation. We're trying to minimize that value of the difference between the observed and pr the predicted values. Uh, and the way we get there is by taking the derivative. So we want to find a point where uh, we kind of bottom out in terms of how the overall measure is changing. Um, that's called an inflection point in the f function. And I'm not going to say anything more about that. Like I said, if you really want to know more about this, you can take a calculus class. Although as somebody who has taken calculus in life, I can say that um, in most parts of life, you don't really need it. Uh, so you're probably going to go through a lot of work uh, for something you don't need for right now. But if you really want to find out, go ahead. I'm all for enlarging your mind uh, if you can. Uh, anyways, here's the derivative of that equation. It looks like this, which is actually fairly similar to what we saw, saw before. But the kind of crucial part over here on the right changes from being um, a squared expression, like the, we talked about the sum of squared deviations. Here, it's no longer squared. We just have a negative 2 out in front of it. Um, if you can see that change right there, this 2, which used to be the power, is now just something we're multiplying that whole business by. Um, and uh, what we want to do now is minimize this or find out what it happens when it's equal to 0 uh, in terms of what the value of b is. So this whole thing is going to be set equal to 0, and we're going to solve for b. And for that, you just need algebra, which hopefully you do have in your toolkit. Um, and if you don't, you can just follow along. So what will the value of b look like once we succeed? Here's what we're starting off with here. Uh, we're going to solve this whole thing for b. So we can start off with by getting rid of that negative 2 factor. We just divide both sides by negative 2. Now we simplified that a little bit. We got that business out of the way. Uh, what can we do with the rest of this to get b off by itself on one side of the equation? Um, so to, for starters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this x sub i minus x mean and multiply it by both of the terms in this uh, bracketed off equation. So this times this and then this times this. What we get is these two um, deviations for x and y multiplied together minus b times the deviations of x squared. Um, and this whole thing is being summed in the nominator of this fraction. And since it's being summed, that means when I'm kind of splitting off like this product from this product, what I can do is just break it up into two different sums. So I've got the sum of the deviation of x times the deviation of y for all i's divided by n, this might look familiar, minus b times the sum of the deviations of x squared divided by n. And at this point, I'll say this probably looks familiar too. Um, and this whole difference is set equal to 0. Believe it or not, I think we've actually gotten through the hard part of this, because now we've converted this into something that looks familiar. And if, even if you can't put your finger on it, um, you should have a feeling like, maybe I've seen that somewhere before. And you have, because I keep telling you about these quantities. So covariance is this, is the sum of the deviations of x times the deviations of y divided by n. Uh, and then we also have this new quantity r, which is the covariance of x and y divided by the standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. We can actually use algebra to tweak this a little bit um, and multiply both sides by what's down here in the denominator of this part and say the covariance of x and y equals r times the standard deviation x times the standard deviation of y. 
Uh, and now that we've done that, we can take another step and say, well, this business here, our first definition of covariance is actually equal to this stuff over here, right? So if this is equal to that, sorry, if this is equal to that, and this is equal to that, then this is equal to that. Algebra, profound, right? Anyways, so what we have from the previous slide is this business minus B times this business equals zero. But this should look familiar, right? So this is the... Um, this is our equation for covariance. It's right up there. So we can just substitute that in uh, and say the covariance of x, of x and y minus b times this stuff equals zero. And I'm actually going to go a step further and say, well, let's um, substitute all this where we see covariance. Now we have r times standard deviation of x times standard deviation of y minus b times this stuff equals zero. And I keep talking about this, and I say it's this stuff but you know what this is, because I've asked you what this is about a million times in this class by now. But this is the variance of x, right? So it's the sum of the square deviations of x divided by the degrees of freedom here, which is n for a population. Um, so I'm just going to substitute that in too. So now we have r times the standard deviation of x times standard deviation of y minus b times the variance of x. And now it feels like we might be getting somewhere, right? Uh, we're, we're still trying to solve for b. We're still trying to figure out what that slope is. Uh, and how do we do it? We will take this equation where we we'll wound up on the last slide. Uh, we'll add both b times the variance of x to both sides, and we get this, r times standard deviation, uh, standard deviation of x times standard deviation of y equals b times the variance of x. I want to solve for b. I can divide both sides by the variance of x, and I get b equals this stuff divided by this stuff. And maybe you can see that, well, this is squared, the squared standard deviation of x on the bottom, or the variance of x, and this is the standard deviation of x on the top. I can actually factor out one of each of those standard deviations and wind up with b equals to r times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. Okay. Like I said, that was a lot of math, but I don't think it was... Um, too overwhelming, or hopefully it wasn't, but the fun part is when we get to this equation at the end, um, is we can kind of go back to where we started with our concept of slope, which is that it's a measure of the rise over the run, so change in y over the change in x. Uh, and we kind of see that here, except it's uh, expressed in um, some new terms. Uh, this is the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. Um, so it's sort of like how much variance there is in y here on the top and how much variance there is on, in x on the bottom, multiplied by r, which is basically a measure of how much of a connection there is between x and y to begin with. That's going to be our slope for this equation. Uh, and if, you know, talking about it in those terms helps you understand what it, you know, is representing, that's great. If not, you can just take this at face value and say, okay, for our best fit line, this is going to be our slope, this relatively not too complicated equation. So this is what I referred to before. It's a best fit line. If we have some messy data that looks like it has showing a connection between two variables, we can draw a line through that mess, which will kind of minimize the um, predictions we're able to make on the basis of x about what the values of y are, which we see here again. So we have the predicted values of y minus the mean value of y equals this slope factor times the observed values of x minus the mean value of x. This is our equation for a best fit line. We can actually go one step further, though, with this um, and sort of solve for the predicted values of y if you want to know exactly what those are. So what I'm going to do is um, add the mean value of y to both sides. That'll factor this one out and then add the mean value of y over there on the right. Uh, and then the last step is that I will multiply this by both of these terms in the parentheses. Um, and I'll get something that looks like this. So this times that plus this times that, which is going to be negative because we have a negative sign here, and then add that to the mean of y. So we, at the end of the day, we can collect those other terms together in two parentheses like this. So y bar minus r times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x times x bar. This stuff... <laughs> And then over here, we have our observed values of i times our slope factor. So this is our slope. This is just our x variable. This is our intercept right there. Um, that is how we make predictions about the value of y 
once we know what the values of x are. Yeah, um, it's a little tricky here, uh, I guess, when you stop and think about it, because uh, in addition to predicting values of y, you kind of have to know what the observed values of y are too, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to figure out what the mean value of y is or the standard deviation of y, so on and so forth. But once you know those, once you have your points, you're plotting a best fit line through that mess, that connected uh, connection between x and y in your graph. And I'll show you how that works using r here in a second. Because like I said, I want to follow all this stuff, this mathematical stuff up with like, you know, practical advice about how to do this on your own using r. Um, put the power in your hands, in other words. So this equation enables us to provide the best possible prediction i.e. the predictions with the smallest combined overall errors of the value of y hat sub i. And we're assuming here, crucially, that there's a linear relationship between x and y. You can do this assuming other kinds of relationships between the two variables, but this is kind of the simplest case. So that's why we're walking through the math in a simple fashion, even if it doesn't seem like that. Um, yeah, so here's our best fit line equation. That's the slope for it. That's the intercept for it. Um, and again, if you don't want to care about the derivation ever again, you don't have to, as long as you know that these are what kind of where the slope and the intercept come from. Um, yeah, so that's where those come from. And now I want to show you how R does all the dirty work for us. Uh, and I'll just give you some basic graphical examples, and we'll just keep building from there as we go into the next pair of lectures uh, next time. Okay, uh, so I'm going to stop for now, uh, but I'll come back again with the commands video here in just a second.